Hello and welcome to this ISM Trust webinar on Ofsted and the key findings from the Music Research Review. I'm Ruth McPherson, Head of Charity Development at the ISM. And to describe myself, I'm a white woman with mid-length white brown hair, sorry, and I'm wearing a headset and a pattern shirt and the ISM Trust logo is behind me. I'm delighted to be joined by HMI Christopher Stevens, Ofsted's subject lead for music, and it's a very appropriate day to be delivering this webinar as Ofsted has just released their subject report for music, so perhaps we'll be hearing a bit, on, bit more on that later. Christopher is one of His Majesty's inspectors and Ofsted's subject lead for music. He's a qualified teacher and as an advanced skills teacher taught music across key stages one to five. Before working for Ofsted, he held various senior management roles within schools, including being the being the Chief Executive Officer of a multi-academy trust. Chris has extensive experience in leading inspections in the maintained and independent sectors. Before we begin the webinar, just a few things to note. During the presentation, please feel free to ask questions using the Q&A function, and we'll do our best to answer these at the end. And do keep an eye on the chat box where we'll be dropping in some useful links. If you experience any technical difficulties, please let us know in the chat and we'll attempt to resolve them. And if you wish to use them, subtitles are available to enable at the bottom of your screen. The webinar is being recorded and we'll share the recording with you afterwards, as well as a feedback survey, which we'd be very grateful if you would fill out. The ISM Trust is the ISM's sister charity, which offers high quality professional development to everyone working in music. And through the ISM Trust, the ISM gives back to the sector and supports and empowers music professionals to succeed. We produce award-winning events, training and resources, which are largely completely free to access. Please do consider supporting the work of the ISM Trust by becoming a friend, making a donation or leaving a legacy. Any support you can offer is much appreciated. So now, without any further ado, I'm very pleased to hand over to Christopher, who's going to discuss the Ofsted Music Research Review and what a high quality music curriculum in England schools looks like. Thank you and over to you, Chris. Thanks, Ruth, and good afternoon, everyone. Just to say I'm a white male, I've got brown short hair, I'm wearing headphones today and I'm wearing a white shirt and a blue and red tie. Um, it's really lovely to be here this afternoon and uh, to join you. The sort of plan for this, for this afternoon is I'm going to sort of give a presentation for about 30 minutes about some of the features, the likely features of a high quality uh, curriculum in music. And then we've got about half an hour, 20 minutes to answer some of your questions. I just want to start really by saying um, a big thank you to the music uh, teachers and professionals on the call today. Um, Ruth mentioned uh, today we published our report in the quality of music education in schools and I, I'll be referring to that throughout the presentation today. But I think one of the really interesting findings in the report is that it makes clear that the impact of COVID really on music education um, was really significant. And the report also makes clear that many, many teachers in many, many music departments were working tirelessly under those conditions to keep music going in schools. Um, I'm not going to talk about this much today in my presentation, but I think people on the call would agree with me that, you know, part of music education in schools, part of a rich music education is all that extracurricular clubs, the orchestras, the groups. And you've made that happen in really difficult circumstances. And I just want to acknowledge that because the report makes it clear that there are still ongoing challenges with making some of those things come back. So thank you, thank you for what you're doing because it's such an important part of music education in schools. Um, in today's presentation, I'm going to set out some of the messages from our research review that was published in 2021, but I'm also going to feed in some of the findings from our report, hot off the press that was published today. Now the focus of this presentation um, is on the curriculum. And when I refer to the curriculum, I'm really talking about what we teach and when we teach it. Um, if you like the substance of what pupils learn, I'm not going to talk so much today about how the content is taught, but of course that's equally, um, equally important. Um, and you'll see from our research review and the published report today that there are sections on that, but today's focus is on the what is taught 
and when it's taught. Um, and at the end of the presentation, as I say, I'm really happy to answer questions about this. Now, before we go on to the presentation, I just want to emphasize really a couple of, well, three points that I hope, well, they're intended to be reassuring. Um, the first one is that the language I use, and later on I'm going to be referring to something called technical progress and constructive progress, and the specific examples that I use, um, it's not my intention that you replicate those in schools. Uh, that's not the intention at all. It's just there to uh, sort of exemplify, if you like, some of the broader points I'm making. So they're, they're there to sort of exemplify general principles. We don't expect schools to use that language. They can if they like. And the specific examples, we don't expect them to copy. Um, they're meant there really to be, to be helpful. As our inspection handbook makes clear, schools have the flexibility to choose their own curriculum approaches um, as long as they're being sufficient thought to its content, its structure, its sequencing and how it's taught. So that's my second point that's meant to be reassuring. And the third point I want to draw your attention to is that um, Ofsted inspects the quality of education in schools. We don't inspect individual subjects. Um, and that's set out in a document called the School Inspection Handbook. Um, and the principles by how we judge the quality of education in the school and the quality of a curriculum are on the, sc are on the screen now in front of you. Um, so on the screen now in front of you, thank you, Ruth, you'll see some of the principles that are set out about when we judge um, the quality of education in a school, when we look at a curriculum. And these are principles that run across the curriculum, across all subjects. I'll just give you a few moments to read those. So again, when we're talking about the curriculum, we're talking about the what and when. And we can see from that slide there, this focus on proactive thinking, a deliberateness about what children learn and when. Now, what we're going to do this afternoon is consider what these principles mean in the context of music education, because of course, subjects work differently. Those are a broad set of principles about a high quality curriculum, but what does that mean in music? And we're going to explore that today. This is where our research review, um, if you haven't seen it, is helpful. It's intended to be helpful. Um, this research review um, is intended to provide the sector and music educators with an overview of what the research tells us about higher quality education in subjects. So we have a science one you can see there, we have a maths one, we also have a music one. And we've intentionally structured these reviews in such a way that they can offer something for different audiences. So if you're a specialist in music, they might provide some really useful insight. And if you're a non-specialist, it's structured in such a way that you can pick out the summaries and the takeaway points. And it'll be the basis of my presentation will be based today on some of those key messages. So hopefully if you haven't seen that, it's a helpful document. So before considering some of the key messages from this research, I just want to make our expectation clear about the role of music in the curriculum. Some of the questions I've had later, and some of you sent them to me beforehand, refer to this. So I think it's a really good opportunity just to make clear about what is the expectation about music and the curriculum. I'll just give you a moment to read that. So this expectation or this requirement for maintained schools and academies to offer a broad and balanced curriculum is set out in the Education Act of 2002. And of course, music is part of the national curriculum. Now, it's important to know that this expectation is also reflected in the national curriculum and is at the heart of our education inspection framework. We expect music in the vast majority of cases to be offered as part of a broad, balanced curriculum. I'll just give you a moment to read those, a little bit more detail about that. Again, our expectation is clear that really music, the expectation is it should be offered as part of a key stage three curriculum. Now, I just want to bring in here um, some of the findings from our research report that we've published today, our music report. There are two separate documents here. There's the research review that sets out 
the features of a high quality music curriculum, what they may be. But today we've published a report on what's actually going on in schools. What have we found? And it's interesting, this point here about music being part of the curriculum. We found actually, this is interesting, that in most primary schools that we visited, actually music's place in the curriculum was increasing, its prominence was increasing. It was only in a very small number of schools that pupils did not have opportunities to learn music in key stages one and two. In these schools, what we found was that leaders characteristically organised the curriculum into several isolated days, and more about that later on, or into blocks of learning. Um, but interestingly, in secondary schools, um, we found considerable variation in the amount of curriculum time allocated to music in Key Stage 3. In just under half of the schools we visited, and we visited 25 secondary schools, leaders had not made sure that pupils had adequate time to learn the curriculum as planned by the school. So it's not to say they should have done X amount of time, but actually the school had said, we want children to learn these things as part of the curriculum. And actually they hadn't given them adequate time to do that. And sometimes we found music on a rotation and sometimes we found music again in isolated one-off days. And this meant in these particular schools, pupils were often not adequately prepared for musical study because they just didn't simply have enough time to practice. And again, a little bit more about that later on. What the slide said there, thank you very much, Ruth, is in key stage two and three, schools need to provide a broad, rich curriculum. If a school has shortened key stage three, inspectors will look for evidence that the school has made provision to ensure that pupils still have the opportunity to study a broad range of subjects commensurate with the national curriculum in years seven to nine. Now we're going to turn now to the research review, the thing we published in 2021, and we're going to focus this afternoon on really one key aspect of this. And the research review and the report we published today starts with a simple but important message. And that message is this, the central purpose of good music education is for pupils to make more music, think more musically and consequently become more musical. Now that key message is there for a good reason. Um, sometimes, and you might be familiar with this, uh, people will talk about music's place in the curriculum as almost being subservient to other subjects. You might be familiar with the arguments such as oh, children do music because it's good for their phonemic awareness or children do music because it's good for their concentration or we do music because it's good for developing children's group work skills. Now those things may well be or may not be true, but the broader point here is actually no, music is part of the curriculum as a subject in its own right. Children learn music on the curriculum. The reason it's there is to give them the opportunity to become more musical as they do in any other subject. And I think it's really important at this moment to really reflect on the ambition of the national curriculum. On the previous slide, I talked about a curriculum that's commensurate with the national curriculum. Well, the ambition of the national curriculum in music is that pupils will become better performers, better composers and better listeners as a result of learning the curriculum. I'll just give you a few examples of that. In the Key Stage 2 national curriculum, it talks about pupils playing musical instruments with increasing accuracy, fluency, control and expression. The focus there being on increasing, getting better at controlling sounds. If we think about another comment in the national curriculum, we've got children will listen with attention to detail and recall sounds with increasing oral memory. That focus again on getting better at listening. And at Key Stage 3, an example we can find is where it talks about pupils identify and use the interrelated dimensions of music expressively and with increasing sophistication, including the use of, and it goes on to talk about tonalities and scales. The focus there being on um, children getting better at music. Now, in other words, simply doing music uh, is not enough. And you know, this is the key message really of this presentation today that it's, we need to be more ambitious than just having music on the timetable having music in the curriculum. It's actually about a music curriculum that supports children, deliberately supports them to become more musical and more later on about what it means to become more musical. Because I'm often asked that question. It's a good question. Well, what does it mean to become better at music? More on that shortly. 
And here again, I just want to pull in why this is so such a significant issue. And I just want to pull again a finding from our recent report, our report today that's been published today. In many schools, when leaders consider the curriculum, their thinking is often focused on giving pupils a range of musical opportunities. That's important, but that's their focus. In these schools, sometimes leaders associated curriculum ambition with the range of activities on offer. So what I mean by that is, is yes, we've got an ambitious music curriculum because we do all these different instruments. Fewer schools, though, had considered ambition in terms of how they were going to incrementally, increasingly develop pupils' musical knowledge and skills. The schools that were successful, and when we're talking about success, we're talking about what children could actually do, focused on deliberately teaching pupils to get better at music, rather than assuming they would get better by simply doing music. Now, these stronger examples were in a minority, but interestingly, our researchers found that many school leaders knew that there wasn't enough focus on musical development. And they were starting to think about that. They were starting to think about how they would develop their curriculum to improve that aspect. So that is why it's such a key issue, because in many schools, sometimes head teachers associate ambition with the activities on offer, rather than thinking about, does this curriculum actually support children to become more musical? And that, in essence, is the ambition of the national curriculum. Now, I've talked about um, the phrase getting better at music and what's on the screen now is a diagram and this diagram attempts to explain what it means to become better at music if you like it's a model and this diagram has three circles and these circles are overlapping and there's a very particular reason that they're overlapping in the middle of those overlapping circles there's a little heart which I'll come back to and these circles have got names it's like a Venn diagram there's a technical aspect, then we have a circle that's around expressive, and then there's a circle around constructive aspects or knowledge. And I'm going to explore these with you to think about what it means to become better at music. And I've got on the right hand side of the slide, musical development, getting better at music, if you like, as a result of planned knowledge and skills progression and deliberateness, and that these three pillars are interdependent elements. They are not three silos. So let's just have a look. Um, we, and that, those silos, that little heart in the middle, could be described as musical understanding, where those three things come together. So the point of the curriculum that I'm stressing here is about children actively getting better at music. So if we turn to the technical aspect, um, and I don't want you to kind of lose focus on the fact that these are overlapping. It's, it's very, very particular and deliberate that. So if we think about this technical pillar, I'm going to call it, um, this is about um, incrementally building children's technique of singing. So I'm thinking there about their posture, their body, their projection, their control, their range. And it might be their building technique of playing instruments, their use of hand and body, their musical control over the instrument. This technical pillar, part of getting better at music is getting better at controlling sound, whether that's through the voice, whether that's through playing instruments, whether that's through music technology. It's about getting better at controlling the instrument. And it's also about children incrementally building their knowledge of technical systems, such as notation or programming or tablature. Now, this aspect of musical learning, it's a really interesting one. And our research review talks about this quite extensively. I mentioned before about children having adequate time to practice and to learn the music curriculum. Now I would say this because I'm a musician, but actually, if you think about subjects across the curriculum, music is actually a subject where if children are going to get better at some of these technical aspects, they need lots of repeated opportunities and they need lots of practice. That is why when we talk about um, uh, when we think about carousels or children doing isolated days, that becomes an experience. Children have a musical experience. Actually, if they're going to incrementally get better at technically controlling sound on an instrument or through their voice, they need practice time. And that's why regular opportunities to learn music are so important. 
Now, a second aspect of this, which I think is really interesting, is that we know that actually building a technique on an instrument is instrument specific. I often say this, and it's a really obvious point, but it's sometimes missed in the way that we think about curriculum design. I like to think of myself as a decent pianist. I still play the piano every day. It's a great love of mine. But I know that it took me many, many years and many, many hours and continuing hours of practice and that I built up some technical com competency on playing that instrument. But I can't transfer that knowledge, that technical understanding to say the, the clarinet or the flute. I, I just don't have it on those instruments. It's a different uh, it's a different kind of knowledge. It's different on different instruments. It's not transferable. And this ability to manipulate sound or to control sound, of course, is central to both performing and it's also central to composing. Children need to be able to control sound in many cases to be able to compose. There's also an argument to say it has an impact on how we listen. Don't know if you've ever noticed a pianist that when sometimes when they're listening to music, I'll do it. I might actually be sort of moving my fingers to the melody. Something to do with the way I've learned the instrument. And what we found in our report that's published today in the schools where we found the most effective teaching and where the children were able to do more. The curriculum developed pupils ability to control sounds through singing or playing instruments or learning music technology. It happened gradually and iteratively over time. Leaders in these schools understood that it took a lot of time to develop the fine motor skills on any instrument or to become a better singer. And in some of these schools, they'd taken the decision to sort of narrow the range of instrument choices that were within the curriculum for that very reason. By contrast, what was so interesting was where we sometimes found the practice was weaker and where children learnt less, they were able to do less, they were less prepared to go on with their musical journey. They often had shallow encounters with too many instruments or insufficient time to rehearse and practice. And consequently, their musical responses were often mechanistic or they showed limited expressive quality. They weren't able to play expressively because actually their technical ability uh, limited their ability to do that. And of course, in some cases, pupils lack of fine motor skills, this technical ability was a significant barrier to actually them being able to create and generate their own music. So it's a really important aspect of musical learning, this ability to build a technique of being able to control sounds. And we know that that is not necessarily transferable across instruments. And it's something to really consider when designing a music curriculum. Now, one of the questions people often ask here, and it's a really good question, is about breadth and experiences. And I'm gonna come on later on to share with you some examples that are in our report where schools have perhaps got a balance here between thinking about giving children a range of opportunities, which is really important, but equally, having a strong focus on incrementally, iteratively building pupil's technique. The second pillar that was on the diagram, that second circle, those overlapping circles, was what I've named the constructive pillar. And this is about learning, and I've got two bullet points here, about incrementally learning how music works, put simply. Developing knowledge of scales, chords, keys, systems, form, structure. Developing broadening your knowledge of those things. That's part of a part of a curriculum. And also about deepening knowledge of the musical elements and the interrelated, interrelated dimensions of music. So this pillar, if you like, refers to the knowledge of how the building blocks of music work together, both analytically and creatively. It includes knowledge of the musical elements, or if you like, the interrelated dimensions of music and the building blocks of composition. Now, interestingly, from our report today, we found that where curriculum thinking was strong, and again, pupils did better, they learnt more, pupils' knowledge of the interrelated dimensions of music or the elements were deliberately and incrementally broadened as they moved through the curriculum. It wasn't left to chance. In these schools, leaders had made sure that pupils had repeated opportunities to learn about the interrelated dimensions of music 
through performance activities, composition activities, as well as specific listening opportunities. Where this worked well, the music, musical features pupils were expected to recognize orally were not extensive. They weren't trying to cover too much. And crucially, pupils were given regular, deliberate and repeated opportunities to hear these musical devices in a range of musical contexts. So that's that second pillar. We've got that technical aspect and we've got this pillar of how music works, knowing more about how music is constructed. And then the final pillar on the diagram was about, was named expressive. Now, I'm just going to read the bullet points on this particular slide. The first one was about building increasing and connected knowledge of music's provenance, its history, its culture, social geography, purpose and meaning. Now, I'm going to just pause at that moment and just make something really, really clear. And hopefully it'll be clear in the examples I share in a minute. We're not saying that actually the point of learning this stuff is to prepare children for a pub quiz. You know, when was Mozart born? That might be important. It might be interesting. Where did this happen? No, we learn these things because it can help us become a better performer. It can help improve our listening and it can help improve our composition. And I'll give some examples about that. We're learning about the music's provenance to inform other areas of the music curriculum. We're not just learning it for the sake of learning facts. Um, this is about practical music making. The second bullet point is about increasing understanding of how the musical elements work together in an interrelated way to give musical expression. So as children develop their understanding of this, they start to be able to use those elements in a way through performance or composition to create musical expression. And final bullet point is about applying that technical and that constructive knowledge with increasing sophistication so that pupils are able to give personal musical meaning to their performances or to their compositions. Now, I'm going to return now, I'm returning to a slide now where I have that diagram again with that heart at the center of everything. And on the right hand side, it says musical development as a result of planned knowledge and skills progression, three interdependent elements, not three silos. Now, I want to make a point here about the three pillars coming together in terms of musical progression. It's a really important point. And I want to share with you how one school that um, we visited as part of today's report went about increasing incrementally developing pupils' knowledge of those three aspects. And you'll note from this example about, interestingly, how they did that in an interdependent and interrelated way. Leaders in this school that I'm thinking about had considered carefully how the curriculum was built from unit to unit happened to be structured in this particular unit in uh, termly blocks. They'd ask themselves really, how does this unit build on what pupils have done previously? So they were thinking about that incremental development. And some units, they explained, built on pupils' ability to control sound, that technical aspect, while others built on constructive and expressive aspects of music. But leaders explained, interesting, this school, that they had a golden thread and that was that pupils would incrementally become better at playing the keyboard as they moved through this key stage three curriculum. Leaders had explained their rationale for this because they felt this knowledge was going to be really important to prepare pupils to be able to use MIDI sequences and the work they were doing later on in the curriculum. But nonetheless, this curriculum was not narrow. Pupils did not just learn to play the keyboard every week, week after week. Leaders ensured that pupils experienced a range of other instruments, but these were used as vehicles for developing pupils' knowledge of constructive and expressive aspects of music. For example, in one unit, pupils were using tuned percussion instruments, and leaders were clear actually the focus of this unit was not on the technical aspects of learning to play those tuned percussion instruments, it was actually about deepening their knowledge of scales. So you can see there a way in which a school is thinking about that progression over time, that technical aspect, getting better at controlling sound, but also incrementally developing their knowledge of the constructive and expressive elements. And I think crucially the point here in this example is there was a deliberateness to what the school was doing. It wasn't happening by chance. Now, I've got a diagram up here again, and this diagram is in a table. And on the left-hand side of the table, I've written performing. 
And at the top, I've got the technical, constructive and expressive, and I've got three columns. And the point about this slide is it shows that actually becoming a better performer involves both incremental improvements in technical aspects, the constructive aspects, how music works and expressive qualities. And the table says this. So part of the technical aspect, if we think about playing the piano, I'm going to give that as an example of a keyboard. The technical aspect of that is over time, gradually iterative development of the motor skill, how to control the sound. I mean, the best example I can think of that is when you think of a child at their first perhaps ever piano lesson and they physically cannot press a key down, particularly around their fourth finger because they haven't the physical strength. And then you think about the technical journey a pianist might go on way beyond the scope of a, of a school curriculum. But you think of the concert pianist with their fingers, the technical fluency, they fly over the keyboard. That's what we're talking about, that development of motor skill. And they're able to play with increasing accuracy and confidence. But performing isn't just about technique. We know that there's the constructive element, being able to use the musical elements well in a performance to create expression. It's part of musical understanding. And then the expressive quality, really lovely example here about actually knowing about where the music comes from can help inform the quality of a musical performance. And I'm going to give you an example of these three coming together, if I may, that I was struck by a very small example, but one I thought was really interesting. So, for example, as part of a school's, if this was in a key stage three example, pupils were learning to play a version of Beethoven's Fur Elise. It was part of their curriculum uh, on the keyboard. And this work had built on previous tasks and it was introducing pupils to some new technical demands, change of hand position in this case. And it was also introducing them to some new constructive knowledge about changes in hand position and chromatic notes that children were being introduced to it, built on what they did before. But in addition, in this school, pupils simultaneously at the same time were learning about the provenance of the music, not just for facts, say, but actually this included information about the purpose of this piece and Beethoven's possible musical intentions. And it was really fascinating to see this because it was clear that this knowledge, this kind of expressive knowledge was introduced to enhance the expressive quality of the pupils playing. It was not there just to teach them about disconnected facts. And it was a wonderful thing to see pupils working with really impressive focus to convey the meaning of the music by concentrating on a really strong legato touch and appropriate phrasing. A really good example of how those three things were coming together in that music curriculum. The technique being developed, their knowledge of constructive elements being uh, incrementally built over time. And that expressive knowledge, that knowledge of provenance, really informing the way that children were performing. And again, if you think about that diagram with the heart in the middle, there we're talking about musical understanding. I think I just wanted to share with you as well, and I've not touched today, I'm coming towards the end of my presentation, about how the music curriculum is taught. And if I get invited back, I'd perhaps love to talk to you about that, because it's clearly an incredibly important part of of how music is delivered in schools. Today, I focused on the principles around what it means to get better at music. But it was interesting because one of the findings of the report today, and it just shows the importance, this is the point I'm making, about how music is taught, the musical teaching that is so important in schools, that we found a number of schools where the curriculum on paper may have built incrementally, but actually that requires musical teaching. So it was not uncommon sometimes for teachers in primary schools, perhaps where they hadn't been given sufficient training to actually stick rigidly to curriculum plans that on paper built incrementally, but their lack of musicianship and often teachers talked about that. It was, they said themselves, they felt unconfident. It meant that they didn't know or couldn't hear whether pupils were actually securing the knowledge they needed to before they moved on. And I think that's a really interesting point that I just want to finish with, that I focus today on the incremental design of a curriculum. But of course, um, it's really important there's a focus on musical teaching to enable that to happen. And, and perhaps in the future, as I said, could come back and talk to you about that because it's such an important aspect of everything that we do. So in summary today, I've got a summary slide here and I'd just like to make two major points. The central purpose of good music education is for pupils to make more music, uh, think more musically and consequently become more musical. 
That's the ambition that's reflected in the national curriculum. It's about children becoming better at music as a result of learning the curriculum. And the second bullet point is about actually what it means to become more musical. That involves the incremental development with th within three interrelated, and I hope this afternoon I've really stressed the importance of those interrelated pillars, that technical aspect, the constructive aspect, and the expressive aspect.